Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Friends of Latin America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube Live. On Sunday, February 6, Costa Ricans took to the polls to elect a new president. According to the latest results reported from Costa Rica's Supreme Electoral Tribunal, TSE, there will be a second and final round on April 3rd between former President Jose Maria Figueres of the National Liberation Party and Rodrigo Chavez of the Party for Social Democratic Progress. Figueres received 27.29% of the vote and Chavez 16.66% with approximately 80% of the results reported. To win the first round outright, a candidate had to secure more than 40% of the votes. The two leading contenders will face each other in a runoff on April 3rd with a total of 25 candidates who were competing against, I uh, should say against a uh, panel of 25 candidates who were competing in the first round. Additionally, all 57 seats of the National Legislative Assembly are also up for grabs. A divided legislature is likely with local media forecasting Figueres' National Liberation Party taking most seats, but well short of a majority. A disappointing election result was the record level of absenteeism. According to the TSE, 40% of eligible voters stayed away from the first round of voting. So joining us today to discuss Sunday's election results is Matt Kierkegaard of Progressive International. We're so lucky to get him this morning. He's been traveling all over Latin America, um, observing elections all over the hemisphere this past year. Uh, Matt was on the Progressive International delegation um, in Costa Rica. You served as a international observer. Uh, so welcome, Matt. So wonderful to have you with us this morning. Matt's joining us from Bogota this morning. <laughs> so Thank you so much, Terry. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I feel so lucky to have you here with all your experience. And you and I last saw each other in, in Colombia, um, spring of last year. So, so here you are back home. Let's, um, let's talk about what happened Sunday in Costa Rica. I'm embarrassed to say, and I will share this with our audience. I'm gonna be learning a lot about uh, Costa Rica today along with our audience. Um, we don't talk enough about Costa Rica. And I think in part, it's we in the Northern hemisphere so identify it as an uh, so strongly allied with, uh, with the United States. We often don't um, talk much about it. I think we may be probably un, right or wrong, take Costa Rica for granted. So we're lucky to have you with us today, Matt. So why don't we start with what actually happened on Sunday? And then maybe we can uh, back into the context that led up to a country of just over 5 million people having 25 candidates for president, which is you wonder how, how united uh, a country can be politically when there's that many. Yeah, that's right. It was, uh, it was a, so I was on the ground in, in San Jose during the, during the weekend and of course for the elections themselves as, a, as an elections observer, as you mentioned. Uh, it was a, you know, quite, quite a, quite a spirited election in the, in the capital itself, but as you mentioned, in the rural areas, uh, especially in the rural provinces outside of the Central Valley, where the majority of the population lives, uh, really record levels of abstentionism in some provinces, even over 50%, uh, which is quite unique for, for the Costa Rican uh, proud democracy that they, uh, that they have. Uh, what actually happened, as you said, was uh, you know, two candidates are moving on to the, to the runoff, um, Jose Maria Figueres, uh, a former president and son of, um, you know, really the sort of founder of, of modern Costa Rica who took power uh, in the 40s uh, through a military coup and then proceeded to, to abolish the military, um, as Costa Rica is, is known for uh, we have really been one of the only countries in the world to not, to not have a military. I can get more into that if we, if, if we, if we want, but that's a, a long, ancient history. Um, and Rodrigo Chavez, who was really you know, the surprise candidate in this, uh, it, it, it emerging in this runoff, pulled you know, about, about 5%, 5 or 6% before. And uh, as you mentioned, ended up the day at the night with, with nearly 17%. So really, uh, I think where a lot of the um, 
of where a lot of the undecided vote went. And, you know, I think it's important to mention really the total collapse of the PAC. Uh, the PAC is, uh, is the Partido de, de Acción Ciudadana. And it was the, the, the rule, it is the ruling, the ruling party for the last eight years. The, um, the presidents have been from, from the PAC. Uh, and they, you know, didn't even get one percent uh, in the election this time. They will be eliminated from from the Congress, from the National Assembly. Uh, so really, a complete repudiation of 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 the ruling um, of the ruling order. Uh, in the Congress, as you mentioned, there won't be a majority for uh, for the Partido de, de Liberación Nacional, um, but there will be probably a, a decent coalition where they can be cobbled together to pass to pass laws. Um, it, it's it's sort of a, an array. The left did much better in in the assembly than in the in the presidential race, uh, and I think that the, the that's the, the Frente Amplio, the, the broad front party, um, and they they were quite happy with with their results, uh, winning about eight uh, percent of the uh, of the assembly, uh, six representatives, all young um, socialist leaders under thirty two years old. Um, so I think they're, they're quite happy with the, the new young group of legislators coming in. Um, and, you know, that's sort of where things stand. I, maybe I can get into to sort of each of the candidates one by one, if that would be, if that would be helpful. Let, let's talk about, well, first of all, that um, you mentioned um, legislatures, young legislatures, socialist legislatures under 32. Mm. I got that to me is really fabulous. <laughs> and a lot of people say, well, they have no experience. I know it's probably better that they have little um, influence. I mean, I think that, I mean, little, um, that's not the word I want, though. they'll have a tremendous influence in the legislature, but don't come with the, um, the history. Yeah. And, and, and we're seeing this throughout the Americas, with the exception of the United States. And I would love us to somehow figure out how to get young people into Congress in the U.S., because we are seeing this throughout the Americas. In many countries, their governments and even their presidential leadership being, you know, under 60, under 50 in many cases, under 40 in some. Mm. And I think that's really um, very, very exciting to see this happening in the Americas. But let's talk about let's talk about the the lead presidential candidates going into the runoff April third. Who they are and what their vision is for Costa Rica for domestic policy and if possible um, uh, yeah. foreign policy as well. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, Jose Maria Figueres has already been already been president in the nineties um, and really comes from a political dynasty in, in Costa Rica, the Figueres. Uh, family. His sister, Cristiana Figueres, is, is uh, you might remember, um, leading the, the UNFCCC, the, the climate change, um, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, for, you know, all, more than a decade, really, during the early 2000s, through all of the sort of uh, the moments when that was most, um, most critical, most in, the, most in the news, and really was seen as a vehicle for, for change. He is a uh, he is a centrist. He is a he's a technocrat. Uh, his vision for national um, development, I think, we could describe as green capitalism, uh, is is basically his model. Uh, and the opening of Costa Rica to um, to to world trade. Uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, he's not. Uh, I think that he is first and foremost uh, a liberal in that sense. You know, he, he's not afraid to work with partners in uh, in Asia, um, but he also is is very much um, looking to open the Costa Rican market to um, to the uh, to, to international capital. And what and to the extent that he even proposes um, and defended on the debate stage. Uh, making English a man that, uh, a co-official language with Spanish and Costa Rica. Um, to, you know, from his perspective, to to give Costa Ricans more opportunity. But really, I think it's clear that this is a uh, a, a chance to you know make Costa Rica a bilingual um, labor force that is able to work for. Amazon or for any other major, you know, international corporations that would love to have, uh, that would love to open call centers and consultancy firms there. 
Um, you know, he, so let me just interrupt because you say open to international capital. And so I'm yeah. thinking, you know, even at the Salak Summit in Mexico City in September of last year, even Laszlo of, of um, Ecuador mm. mentioned, you know, wanting to trade you know, mm. internationally and open up their markets. And he was very clear. Russia, China, U.S., not exclusively U.S., but I'm hearing you say international capital and then making English an equivalent <laughs> language to Spanish. So they're looking to the north in or this they're, particular they're looking, the, they're looking to the north, but I think they also, you know, this is a, he's a former World Economic Forum guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think they will be looking strongly to, um, uh, strongly to, strongly to, to, to China frankly, and to, yeah. and to the rest of Asia as well. Uh, Costa Rica was one of the first countries, I believe, to, to recognize uh, China, even with its sort of deeply um, anti-communist history. Um, you know, the, the sort of the history of, you know, just very briefly, the, a bit of the history of Costa Rica, you know, in the, uh, after Figueres' father uh, took power by military force in the 40s, you know, this was an, an anti-communist uh, coup. Um, and basically, the, 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 the negotiation with the United States was, you know, we'll be your anti-communists in Central America, um, but you have to let us develop on a social democratic path. So they nationalized the bank, um, you know, they invested heavily in, uh, in, in, in education and in, um, and in medicine, and, you know, this has sort of led Costa Rica to uh, be able to plow a lot of the money um, that would have been used probably in, in, in Cold War conflicts into you know, social development. And this is sort of, you know, brings Costa Rica to where it was today. Of course, the bargain was, you know, we'll always be your anti-communists. The Communist Party was banned until the, uh, the mid-70s. Um, and there's never been, you know, really a, a protagonist's left force um, since, since, the, since before the 40s. Um, and, and that's sort of where things where things remain today. And that's the vision that Figueres will, will continue on. It's important to mention that, you know, he was also, Figueres was, was also the, he began to sort of undo this social democratic uh, compromise at the beginning of the 90s. He was the first one to privatize um, many of these uh, formerly public institutions. I think that's a major threat mm -hmm. um, that his presidency represents, to be, to be honest, uh, moving forward. Yeah, you know, this continued privatization, especially in favor of uh, you know, whatever it'll be, it'll be yeah, probably sold as dynamic green development that we can only do through the private sector. Um, and so, so th these are things to, to watch out for in, in a Figueres, a probable Figueres presidency. I think he would be favored. He's heavily favored to win. And Rodrigo Chavez, uh, as I mentioned, is the surprise candidate, his, his competitor now, uh, sold himself basically entirely as a technocrat to say, I went to Harvard, I speak five languages, I worked at the World Bank, I know how to go Costa Rica on the next path. What are my policies? What's my ideology? You know, it's doing the right thing always. You know, it's, uh, he, he served as minister, um, he served as minister in this current government uh, and, you know, was, was, was forced out relatively quickly. Uh, he doesn't want to go as far as, you know, making English a, uh, a co-official language, but he wants to make English mandatory in schools. Um, and, you know, I think his, his probable electoral strategy will be one of anti-corruption, you know, because of the sort of dynastic elements of the Figueres uh, family, that comes with a lot of baggage. Um, and, you know, Figueres is, I think, widely, uh, he's, he's, associated widely in Costa Rican society with, um, with elements of corruption, especially in the 90s and, and 2000s, you know, right or wrong. And, you know, I think that it's given the, the forces that sort of remain that didn't make it into, into the runoff, I, I believe Rodrigo Chavez's strategy will likely be a, a national anti-corruption front to say, you know, I'm the right guy for the job. And uh, Figueres is corrupt, and we, from across the spectrum, from left to right, to me in the center, are prepared to, uh, you know, weed out corruption uh, at the national level. We'll see how well it does. I, I think it's, you know, Figueres isn't a shoe in, but uh, he is probably the, the, the candidate favorite to win at this point. You know, it's fascinating listening to you. Um, 
because, well, there's several things I'm thinking simultaneously here. One, the importance of these young people in the legislature to make sure whoever becomes president um, develops a nation favorable to a new generation of Costa Ricans. And it's, it sounds like that pressure is gonna really have to come from the legislature and from the, and from the citizens themselves yeah. in order to get what they want. It doesn't sound like either candidate is really focused on a true national program for its citizens. Um, and also, how do you uh, how do you explain these two men coming out of you know a field of twenty five candidates? The population of Costa Rica is just over five million people. So you have five million people who have split and well and then those aren't even not everybody is actually of age to vote but of those five million people you have you know political sympathy across 25 candidates yeah. is this yeah. an extraordinarily fraction well i factionalized fractionalized population or is there or is the this a result of not any one candidate having a real strong clear vision for the country yeah, I think it's important to take a so to take a step back. Uh, in the early two thousands, um, the you know Costa Rica uh, signed and then ratified uh, CAFTA, which is the Central American okay. Free Trade Agreement. And this was really um, it, it was fought hard. It was another sort of privatizing moment uh, for these um, these, uh, these public institutions that had served Costa Rica well through throughout the the you know the second half of the twentieth century. And there was a major reaction against this by by the people and also by you know organized elements of civil society and it led to you know in 2012 and 2014 uh the first time ever that you know the sort of two-party system was broken the pack and 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 this was you know really seen as a uh, as a moment for possibly the left possibly the center left uh to you know an election that was won on the repudiation of free trade agreements and ended up, you know, being a mandate for for two, you know, for two terms, um, leading us up to this present moment. That didn't get anything done, um, and so you know, it was in a in a similar sort of way, you know, maybe to a to a U.S. audience that you know people felt after the Obama presidency to say, you know, we had so much hope and 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 for change in this moment. And nothing happened. Um, and so I think, you know, what we're seeing now is really uh, people looking for any alternative. And so you know, with, with no candidate even breaking a quarter of, of the vote, this is really a reflection of this. You know, people are looking for any, any, anyone who they feel, you know, represents uh, uh, something new, something that, it, you know, breaks with the, um, the, 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 uh, the status quo. And what what you end up getting with such with such rupture is actually <laughs> the status quo has, has come back has has reasserted wow. itself even even more strongly now. So you know maybe it's important to just mention very quickly you know some of the the candidates that that didn't make it, um, but you know represent important forces uh, in the country. First of first and foremost, uh, Fabricio Alvarado, who is a, a you know a right wing. Uh, you know, Pentecostalist fundamentalist who did make it into the runoff last time um, and was expected probably to make it into the runoff this time, he did not. Um, but he, you know, he represents probably, you know, a, a strong 15% block of, you know, of an evangelical, really right-wing movement that has consolidated, has consolidated itself in the country. And, and there are two others, I think, that are, that are worth mentioning, one being um, you know, Elias Feinzeig, who, you know, represents basically the, the libertarian, urban, young, um, uh, you know, where we are woke, but we love capitalism sort of um, uh, 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 formation. And he won about 10%. And the, the real left wing, Frente Amplio, who also won 10%. So while there were 25 candidates, you know, really, these are the candidates that actually uh, were able to break above one or two percent um and and actually you know appeared on the debate stage and appeared in the national discourse uh so these are this is sort of the the buffet of <laughs> of, of of options that were 
that were um, being discussed regularly in, in Costa Rican society. And, you know, I think a lot of those undecided, a lot of those people who used to vote for the PAC, uh, it looks like went for, for Rodrigo Chavez. Uh, and, and one thing that we haven't I didn't, I forgot to mention when I, when I discussed him before was, you know, much of, of the discussion, especially, you know, in the debates themselves and being attacked by the other candidates were, you know, his two sustained um, sexual harassment complaints at the World Bank. He's no longer uh, able to go to the World Bank as a farmer. Wow. And, uh, you know, as these complaints were, as I said, uh, uh, sustained. And, you know, the other candidates just hammered him on this. Sure. But it appears that, I, it appears that the voters uh, care. Were, yeah, they didn't. They didn't care, um, which is a surprise for me, uh, especially in Costa Rica. Yeah. But, but you know, this 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 conversation of, of gender equity, of of feminism, especially emerging emerging from from younger voices, from a new generation demanding something better, uh, has taken center stage. If it took you know a hit at this in in this uh, election, mm -hmm. so. You know, this is something that um, comes up as we're watching so many nations de uh, emer develop emerging economies in the in the hemisphere. We progressive to leftists, there's a real um, difference. Well, and, and and understandably so, given you know where your politics originate, what your culture is, where what your nation of origin is, but talking about um, the sexual harassment suits and whether they matter to people or not. One, some people just look at that and say, you know, it's tabloid news and let's move on. Other people take it quite seriously. But there is this real, um, and I think probably an episode, I'd love to have you come back and just talk as a separate subject. What we would define on the left as social Marxism versus economic Marxism. Mm. And some of us, you know, in the global north and wealthy countries have evolved and or have the luxury to talk about social equity, social, social Marxism, whereas emerging nations are more concerned about economic equality, economic growth, economic Marxism. And there's a big divide on the left as mm. to what, you know, how that shakes out. And it really has to do with so much of your cultural and national origin and where you are as mm. far as you know economic and political evolution. I mean, I would say that for many feminists in Central America and South America, again, depending on the country, that you know abortion rights are huge for the mm. women in the global north. But in in nations south of us, feminism is described as how do I get electricity and running water into my house? How do I get my kids, you know, public education? How do I get my family health care? Those things first, and also tend to be uh, of more, um, more conservative socially as well, particularly in rural areas. And so it's interesting to, for just to hear, you know, that some people read about the, the World Bank issue and some it's just, you know, let's move on or it just, let's move on, it's tabloid news, or right now, it really doesn't matter. We need other things for our people and our society before well, we and, talk about that. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned the, the, you know, the, the cultural uh, setting, and I think this is really critical in, in Costa Rica. I mean, it is a deeply, a deeply conservative and Catholic uh, and Christian uh, nation to the extent that it's the only, I believe it's the only nation in the, in the Americas um, I believe that, fact check me, but I believe it's the only nation in the Americas that uh, still has a state religion, um, and that state religion oh, is Catholicism. So it is not a state, wow. it is not a secular state. Um, it is a Catholic state. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to the to the extent that, you know, uh, a, a, in, in their, um, on their logo for, you know, um, uh, their public health system, you know, Mary appears with with Jesus or <laughs> something very yeah. about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is, this is the state of things. I think, you know, where you're seeing a lot of support for the Frente Amplio for the left um, is emerging from, from the universities, from young people, um, uh, not exclusively, but to a large extent, this is where it's being, where it's being driven from. Um, and I think the big question for, for the Frente Amplio will be you know, how much they can, they can break out of this 
uh, this formation, which you know is maybe ten percent, as we've seen of the of the population that that really is 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 going to going to the ballot box on these terms, um, and can break into um, you know a more national project that they that the population feels is supporting uh, you know all aspects of of society and really driving uh, forward to a more egalitarian. Um, uh, substantive democracy. I think this was their, uh, this is still in their, um, in, in, you know, this is in their program, but making that a reality is, a, is another, is another piece of work altogether. I think a lot of work remains to, to connect to the bases um, in Costa Rica, to connect to the working class. Um, and I think that will be the task of the Fente Amplio for, for this, uh, for this coming four years um, and, and well beyond that. <laughs> It's um, let's talk a little bit about Costa Rica's relationship with its neighbors mm -hmm. and how these election results on April 3rd could or could not affect any substantive change mm -hmm. in its um, in its regional relationships and and then also across across the hemisphere. I mean, I think you and I would both agree we are in a particular moment in the Americas we we are seeing you know, a multilateral, multipolar paradigm unfolding mm. uh, before our very eyes yeah, and how wide it spreads and how rapidly it spreads, you know, we don't know, but we are certainly watching mm. this happen with um, all the election results that occurred last year. Mm. So many of them have embraced uh, global trade, China, even Argentina now has announced that it's going to join the Belt and Road Initiative, particularly for energy projects. So how does Costa Rica play into this? How do you see its role? Yeah. I, well, I think that you know, one of the interesting things about Costa Rica is that folks there are not under any illusions as to sort of their place in the global economy. As you mentioned, it's, it's 5 million people. It's one of the smallest countries in the hemisphere. Uh, and they're they're very attentive to, to international trends because you know frankly they sort of have to ride those waves wherever they wherever they go, um, and you know so I think if we were to see I'm being hopeful here but I think if we were to see you know a, a real project for for regional integration emerge in a in a much more serious way um, at the end of this year possibly with the election of Lula and Petro and you know in in coordination with you know Boric and and Fernandez in Argentina and AMLO in Mexico, I don't think it would be at all inconceivable to, for, for Costa Rica to, to, to join those efforts. I think, you know, if that's where they see the tides moving, I think they will, they will follow that. On the other hand, if that doesn't materialize, I think they won't have any, <laughs> any qualms about, um, you know, cozying further to up to the United States, um, given their, their longstanding relationships, uh, you know, uh, in North America, and their, frankly, dependence on, in, on, on northern tourism to, to really drive the country's economy, um, which I think will only be probably be deepened uh, even further as this move towards you know, green capitalism intensifies and uh, you know, more hotels, more luxury hotels are built uh, and inequality deepens. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, 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 this is, I think they're pragmatists. I don't think that they, they are, um, either of these two candidates have, uh, you know, deep ideological convictions in the, in this space. Um, but I, I don't think that we'll see any changes with, you know, their approach to, you know, for example, Nicaragua on their Northern border or Venezuela, or, you know, any of the, any of sort of the, the they're not going to join the revolutionary movement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't think we'll see any changes. And if, if we do, um, it will be cut. It will be because there, uh, there's sort of no way to no way to avoid it. Um, this is. Do you see them more um, maybe aligned with Mexico and Argentina's political and well, you can't compare economically because those other two countries are so huge. But Mexico and Argentina kind of hold a specific space in the progressive countries. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I know people who work in both governments and they're very clear, we're the only two progressive nations in the Americas. <laughs> I mean, you know, so they, they have carved out that specific definition of, you know, their economies, their politics and their role in the hemisphere. Um, you see Costa Rica more in line with that or? 
No. I no, agree with you. No. They're not leftists, for sure. No, I, I don't think that, I, no, I don't. And I don't think that we're going to see any um, real progressive change, um, except for perhaps, you know, um, uh, some leadership on, you know, their continued leadership sort of on, on climate and environmental issues. But even that has, you know, is not, is, is especially if Figueres were to win, you know, both of these, um, both of the leading candidates do not support the Escazú Treaty. The Escazú Treaty was, mm -hmm. it is in, you know, Escazú is in Costa Rica itself. Um, but it's a, it's a really a landmark um, regional treaty to protect environmental defenders um, and to, to secure information um, regarding large, uh, large projects that would impact the environment. And, like, you know, like, um... Uh, what was it like, you know, mega projects, like yeah, hydroelectric but, but, dam and mining and things like that? Things like this, but also specifically mm -hmm. surrounding, you know, guaranteeing rights for environmental defenders. So the communities yeah. that defend those lands um, that are so often assassinated or, yeah. uh, or, or harassed in other ways across the region, um, you know, speaking here from Colombia, you know, this is yeah, yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of activists. <laughs> you see some of the worst in the world there, actually. Absolutely, and but I mean, of course, you know, the, the famous case of Berta Cáceres in, in Honduras. You know, we, we see this across the we see this across the the, the hemisphere and across the world, really. Um, and this is an attempt to change that. And both of these pres both both of these candidates, you know, I don't think will will ratify that agreement. Um, Are these principally affecting indigenous people in Costa Rica? Uh, or they 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 are. Uh, I well. Yes, I mean, most strongly, yes. Um, but I think they are also affecting, you know, campesino and rural, so peasant and, and rural, mm -hmm. uh, rural communities as well. The indigenous population of Costa Rica, I believe, is about is about three percent, so so less than than in, in other parts of the uh, of the region. But yes, these are the principally the lands that are under attack, and it's, um, you know, sort of in line for <laughs> for new development and and, and violence. So. Uh, you know, no, I don't. I don't think we'll see any any great changes by both of these uh, both of these candidates. Uh, don't support any changes to 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 you know abortion legislation, for example. They right now Costa Rica has um, only in in the life in the case of the life of the mother uh, is a, is abortion permitted. And you know both of these candidates have said you know we won't. No, no. What's the word? Um, no back, you know, no moving backwards, but no moving forwards. No moving things exactly they are. So, <laughs> no, I don't think we'll see any, any progressive change, really, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, so the next round, the final round, the runoff is April 3rd. Are you going to be back in Costa Rica for, for that? I don't think I will be back, unfortunately, uh, just due to scarce resources. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, it, it it will be it will be April third, and you know we are, I think, completely confident in the integrity of the electoral process. Uh, in my in my observation there, you know, there was really nothing to be uh, too alarmed by, um, except for you know the entry of private money into politics, as we've all, we're always seeing. <laughs> Uh, and seeing more and more of, um, but really, you know, I, I, I think this is, it should be a, a, probably a clean process, a transparent process, and one where we will likely see Figueres come out on top again. Wow. Well, it's going to be an interesting, <laughs> it's going to be an interesting to see how it all unfolds and how, and how uh, Costa Rica moves forward in this new, this new paradigm that we're watching. Because it, it could be very exciting for all of us, you know, even, even more conservative countries like Costa Rica, even Ecuador, even as I mentioned earlier, has embraced, you know, trilateral, just unilateral trade with the U.S. And so it mm -hmm. could, be, could be very good for all of us, including those of us like me from the United States, <laughs> could, could eventually force our own, our own, you know changes as well so so matt is there anything that we should we should talk about before i let you go anything that i i over you know glaringly omitted or anything that you would like to share with our audience no i think that's i think we really hit it all you know i mean one thing i forgot to mention just uh you know when i was doing a little bit of fact checking myself as we were uh in this interview is that you know costa rica was one of the one of the first countries in south america or in central america to join the Belt and Road. So, you know, there, there are continuing 
development initiatives also from, from China happening there. And I think, as I said, I think you'll really see this sort of pragmatic approach uh, moving forward. I don't think that we're going to see too many changes um, or you know, a hard shift to the United States, even though neither of these candidates are you know, progressive by really any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, but Costa Rica also has a lot of parallels to the US, uh, especially in its, in its composition to its composition of, of, of left forces. And I think we'll probably be learning together, uh, how to move forward in a more, um, in a more powerful way and, and in a way that we can build, where we can build power. So, you know, I think, uh, lots of, lots of contact with, with, with the comrades in, in Frente Amplio will be will be important for for folks in the US and especially um, in a nation that's so affected by by US tourism by US contact um, more important all the time so just wanted to say thank you very much and uh, and and that's all for me okay thank you so much <laughs> I'm so glad you had time to talk with us today especially having just returned um, from the elections on Sunday in Costa Rica so I want to just remind our audience, you've been watching What the F is going on in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. We broadcast every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and also be sure to catch Code Pink Radio, which broadcasts every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern on WBAI out of New York City, simulcasting out of WPFW, Washington, D.C., uh, so thanks again, Matt. Really wonderful to have this conversation and to see you, <laughs> at least by Zoom. And, you, um, and we should talk about Colombia, the upcoming Colombia elections next, and and what we can all do to uh, to to support, uh, you know, what's going on there. Absolutely. Thanks, Terry. And uh, yeah, if folks want to learn more about Progressive International, it's uh, Progressive dot International, um, and you know we'll be keeping tabs on Colombia. Uh, both through their both through their congressional elections in, in next month, as well as their you know really highly uh, contested presidential elections in in May and June. Okay, more to come, folks. Thank you so much. <laughs>